Okay, everyone, I am picking up after a loss of internet um, where I left off. So Professor Sackett Taylor here, this is for Econ 321 National Resource Economics. We're talking about population control and the environment. So we were just looking at the United Nations um, projections for population growth and how um, if we actually want to stabilize and potentially decline population over time, it's going to require a sincere investment in education, especially in the developing world. So if we were to look at fertility rates currently around the world, we can see that the fertility rate is highest in areas of sub-Saharan -Sahar Africa, um, specifically in Nigeria, Mali, and Niger. Um, but there's other parts of the world that also have pretty high levels of fertility. Um, so this is like the average number of children per, per um, person, per person who is capable of being pregnant, of carrying a pregnancy. So it's 5.7 in Nigeria, 6.4 in Mali, 7.6 in Niger. That's average. I mean, other parts of the world is pretty high as well. 3.3 um, in Guatemala, 4.6 in Iraq, and 5.1 in Afghanistan. You can see um, where, like, this is just kind of geographically mapping out where these uh, fertility rates are highest. Um, and so you can see it, they're really very concentrated here um, on the, in the continent of Africa and in parts of the Middle East. So speaking of, um, this is a great short video talking about um, how Africa is going to handle the in the in like increase in population um, going forward. So let's watch this short video. Planet's population is seven and a half billion and growing every year. By 2050, it's estimated to be close to 10 billion. This population boom will be dominated by one continent, Africa. In just 30 years, the US will be overtaken by Nigeria to become the world's third most populated country behind China and India. And by the end of the 21st century, 4 billion people will live in Africa making up 36% of the world's population. Africa has the second largest population after Asia, but it's far less dense than Europe's. So if it has the space to accommodate more people, then why are so many analysts worried? Because they believe Africa doesn't have the infrastructure to handle it. In Nigeria, the National Population Commission says this increase puts a severe strain on a nation to provide enough schools and health facilities. Add in an extra billion or so people in the next 30 years and you have a big problem. And it's not just Africa that will face the consequences. The reason for Africa's rapid population growth is down to improvements in public health care, which has not only increased life expectancy, but also led to an inspiring decrease in the number of deaths amongst babies and infants. While sub-Saharan women are having less children than 50 years ago, it hasn't prevented the dramatic upsurge in populace. Many experts warn that African birth rates are too high and that family planning programs designed to increase education and prosperity for women haven't had the same attention, resulting in only some, if not any, reduction in fertility rates. This has largely come down to the reluctance by men to use contraception due to religious teachings, social norms, and misinformation about the side effects. Some activists, however, argue that Western NGOs and governments are discussing African population reduction, not because the continent is unable to feed its two billion people, but because those same Western governments want to preserve African resources for their own people instead. The US and Europe consume 80% of the world's natural resources, but represent just under 15% of the world's population. Western nations, particularly in Europe, may also be motivated by the ongoing migration crisis. Europe has witnessed unprecedented levels of migration arriving on its Mediterranean coastline following the Arab Spring in 2011 and the ongoing Syrian civil war. 
and as the African population grows, the influx of migrants looks set to intensify. In Africa, the side effects are numerous, from pressures on food and water supplies to an increased threat of corruption at local and national levels. So what are the solutions? It's called a demographic dividend. Governments across sub-Saharan Africa will be hoping that fast population growth will create a young workforce that can drive economic growth. But that can only happen if there are enough jobs for them to fill. According to recent research, between 18 and 20 million jobs will need to be created across the continent over the next 25 years. And if that doesn't happen, millions of unemployed young people will become a perfect recruiting environment for both militant Islamist group Boko Haram and human traffickers selling dreams of a better life in Europe. So where do the jobs come from? Some countries are focusing on an industrial revolution, turning farmers and fishermen into makers. Ethiopia, for instance, is the fastest growing economy on the continent, and it's all built on massive infrastructure investment. They now have brand new six lane highways, electric railways, and vast social housing estates. But in Nigeria's largest city, Lagos, the need for new housing has created new problems. Vast slums in the megacity have been bulldozed to make way for luxury high-rise apartments, despite alleged court orders to halt the destruction. Authorities argue that people are being resettled and compensation is being paid, but rising inequality is a real concern. The fact remains that with millions still living in poverty and a population that is set to rise at a dramatic rate, the continent will face serious challenges. Regardless of their motivations, both non-African and African nations have a role to play to turn the continent's rapid population growth into a positive, more modern, sustainable environment. The planet's population is seven and a half billion and growing. So what we're looking at here is a need to have a demographic transition. And so the demographic transition that we're talking about is the tendency at first for death rates, then birth rates to fall. So we deal with getting people healthier. So reducing infant mortality, reducing child mortality, reducing mortality during childbirth um, and increasing life expectancy through greater access to public health resources. Then when those things start to happen and people are able to accumulate more wealth, they're able to invest in education, they're able to have a higher standard of living from being healthier people, then we see birth rates begin to fall because people want to start choosing that high investment few children strategy. And so as society develops economically, population growth rates will first increase before they decrease. The idea is we would like to bring it to a replacement fertility level. This is a fertility level that would result in a stable population, um, and it's taking into account those other metrics on maternal, infant, and child mortality rates. So essentially, you're just replacing yourself. You're not adding to the population. Unfortunately, we're not there. Our current situation is one where First of all, just like named in that video, developed countries are disproportionately exploiting the global en environmental resources, both as a sink and a source. So the source meaning we extract resources um, from developing areas and we use those developing areas as a sink for our waste. And we're using up the absorptive capacity um, of, of these places contributing by far to the highest proportion of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, another factor is, you know, factor that contributes to fertility decline is the education of girls and women and access to family planning versions of healthcare, um, including contraception. But this is present in some countries and not others. So projections of population stabilization really depends on getting those um, that rapid fertility decline to be more widespread, which may or may not happen. And in places where economic growth has been really strong, unfortunately, like trickle down economics is 
uh, is com complete BS. Um, we don't actually see wealth trickle down through economic strata. Um, so this kind of wealth that's associated with economic growth does not end up filtering down to the poorest people in society. So we get increased inequality in that the richer, the rich are now richer and the poor are now poorer. Um, so we have exacerbated this to the point where we have huge numbers of people living in extreme poverty throughout the world. Um, and these places have essentially dual economies, right? A lot of places in Southeast Asia and in Latin America, you know, there's simultaneously like these bustling cities of urban development where people are doing fairly well and have a high standard of living. And they coexist, not even geographically very far from extreme rural poverty. People who have act like are, you know, experiencing famine and disease and war. Um, and, you know, what we're finding is that even within the same city, like they mentioned in that video, um, you have, you know, luxury high rise apartment buildings right next to slums. Um, and so this is not sustainable. So I've thrown a bunch of definitions on this slide to aid in where the conversation is going next around um, the relationship between population growth and economic growth. So when we're talking about economic growth, we have to talk about returns to scale. And so this is just a friendly reminder from your micro theory days that constant returns to scale means that when you increase inputs, the outputs increase by the same proportion. If we have increasing returns to scale, output increases faster than inputs. If we have decreasing returns to scale, output increases slower than inputs. And so we tend to experience the law of diminishing returns, which states that if we continually increase production inputs, eventually they yield decreasing marginal output. So we get diminished return over time. Um, and so what we really want to look at here is how we think about production um, in our theoretical models and where we start to see evidence that population actually needs to be included in this equation. Um, because traditionally in your economic theory courses, you saw something like a Cobb-Douglas production function where production was based on, you know, output is a, a a formal equation based on capital and labor. Um, and we can determine returns to scale by their um, exponents. But for two things, one, this equation assumes infinite economic growth is possible and does not put any kind of limitation on availability of natural capital. And it doesn't actually show us the relationship between population and labor. That is what portion of our population is going to be able to be members of the labor force. In general, the research suggests that population growth negatively impacts economic development over time. Um, and this is for four primary reasons. The first is that um, it increases dependency. So families have to spend more on supporting their dependent children. The more children they have, the less money they have to save, which lowers the national savings rate. And so it also, at the same time that people are saving less, requires them to spend more on things like health and education, which reduces overall funds in a society for any form of capital investment in economic, you know, and capital investment it was what creates economic growth, right? When we invest in capital now to enhance our productive ability going into the future, that, that's where growth is created. And so if we are not saving money, so there's no money to be invested, and where um, the government is spending more on healthcare and education to support this larger population, then capital investment is just not going to happen. And so we see that this slows capital accumulation and economic growth over time. The second factor is that increase in, in economic income inequality. 
Um, so, you know, the rapidly growing population will have an excess supply of labor. There'll be more people wanting to work than there are actual jobs available. And so when you have a huge supply of labor that outstrips demand for labor, what that what happens is it pushes the price of labor, which is the wage down. And so it brings down wages. And so we see high rates of unemployment, high rates of underemployment, people who'd be like, who would like to be working more than they are, and a large class of extremely poor people who have no access to benefits and um, who are earning really low wages. We have limitations on the capacity of the earth, right? Natural resource limitations. So we have a limited supply of land, a limited supply of non-renewable resources. And so um, in general, we tend to assume that technological progress will overcome these limitations. But as we know from an ecological economics perspective, the substitution that is assumed between natural capital and human capital or natural capital and productive capital is not real. You cannot simply substitute or replace everything that the environment gives us because the environment is a complex interdependent system. And you, when you remove one piece of the system, um, the rest of the system is affected. It's not just about replacing that one piece with something that you believe is a substitute. So environmental problems become more per pervasive, more complex um, to solve. And finally, we see market failure. So as population growth accelerates and begins to deplete resources, wherever um, private property rights or social property rights are really poorly defined, um, so thinking about areas in Africa, in Latin America, um, population pressure is going to start to, um, you know, exhibit tragedy of the commons behavior, where we're going to see deforestation, um, desertification, um, you know, areas where natural resources are completely depleted by nature of the common pool resource problem, right? Tragedy of the commons. More people um, involved in, in managing common pool resources usually does not um, produce better outcomes, produces worse outcomes. So population growth tends to worsen the existing um, problems we see that are not controlled well. So a better um, way to think about how we can we can include both population and economic well-being in a single equation is the IPAT equation. This is an in ecological impact equation. And it says that the impact on the earth is equivalent to um, or is dependent on three causal factors of most environmental problems. And that's how big the population is and how fast it's growing. How much each person in that population consumes and how that consumption rate is growing. And the damage per unit of consumption inflicted by the technology available. So really we're looking at um, the impact on the earth is a population problem, it's a economic consumption problem, and it's a technology problem. So a discussion question here posed by the authors of our textbook is about the concept of carrying capacity. So it's useful for ecological analysis, especially when we're concentrating on animal and plant populations. But can we use the concept of carrying capacity the same way when we're analyzing human populations? Where, are, where is it effective and appropriate and where is it not? Um, so really thinking about how we extend methodologically uh, a concept that is really based in um, the environmental sciences and how we start to apply it to human behavior and human societies. All right, so that's it for this time. I think this this uh, this set of content, this content really leaves like more questions than it does provide answers. But these are things to just start thinking about and being aware about because that's going to be um, you know the awareness piece has to come first before we can even think about how we address these problems. So until next time.